Welcome to One on One with Mitch LaFawn. And joining me on this episode from Bad Company, it is drummer Simon Kirk. We talk about his new album, All Because of You. Look back at his time with the band Free, the history of Bad Company, including the Brian Howe years, and the help he provided during 9-11. Before checking that out, please head over to Twitter and check me out at Mitch LaFon, M-I-T-C-H-L-A-F-O-N, paypal.me forward slash Mitch LaFon, should you care to support the podcast. And now, without further ado, here is the one, the only, drummer Simon Kirk. We are speaking with the drummer Simon Kirk. The new album is All Because of You. Uh, pleasure to speak with you, Simon. And you, Mitch. Nice to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, I've, I've had a chance to, to listen to the album. And um, mm. it really is interesting, especially the, the ukulele version of, um, you know, <laughs> Feel Like Making Love. So let's yeah. start with that. Let's start with the album and, and Will You Tour It and all this wonderful stuff. And then maybe we'll go back into some of the, the history of Free and Bad Company, all that stuff. So, Sure. Uh, well, in fact, let me start well, here, uh, if I may, yeah. just because the last album was Filling the Void in 2011. It seemed very mm. introspective, it, you know, especially dealing mm. with some of the subject matter. Is this mm. more of the same in terms of, of introspection, or is this more of a... No, sort of, okay. it's not. I mean, my life has changed quite a lot in the last few years. You know, I got divorced, and I have a new lady in my life, Maria, and uh, a lot of the songs were written with her in mind, you know, she was my muse, uh, <clears throat> and it's a lot more upbeat than uh, Filling the Void, which, which dealt with personal problems and, and addiction and so on. Um, so, no, it's a complete departure from that. And I feel like Making Love came about uh, by accident, really, because my daughter Lola has been playing ukulele for quite a few years, and she loves it, and so I bought one, and I was just sort of noodling in my apartment and I started playing the, the verse to feel like making love and singing. And <clears throat> Maria heard it. And she said, oh, that's nice. You should do that. And I said, whoa, hang on. She's a little younger than me. So she doesn't know, you know, the original version of feel like making love like a lot of other people do. Um, and I said, look, you know, I'm just sort of playing around with it. And it would be heresy to do a, a, a reggae version of such an iconic song. And she said, well, that's that's bullshit. You know, you should do it. It really sounds great. So I sent the MP3 to the band in Chicago, the Empty Pockets, who backed me on this album. And, and they're, you know, they're youngsters. They're in their 20s and early 30s. And they loved it. And... Um, so we put a treatment together and it was the first song that we recorded in Chicago and we sent it to BMG tentatively to see how they would like it and they all loved it. And then, of course, I had to uh, call Mick and Paul, Mick Ralphs and Paul Rogers, who were the original uh, writers of the song, and they liked it as well. So they gave me the thumbs up. So it, it uh, you know, it got on the album. Yeah, it turned out actually quite good. Um, talking about uh, Mick, uh, how is he hmm. doing, by the way, these days? Well, as far as I know, um, he has paralysis in his left side uh, because of the stroke, he, he, which hit him about three days after the final show in England. Uh, we're all very, very sad. They, you know, would. I am particularly because, you know, he's been a good friend of mine for, uh, for uh, many, many years since since the days of free. Um, and I just pray that he makes a recovery. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're all praying for that. Um, uh, thank and, you. And, and not to, to minimize it, but I do want to get back to your album. Um, mm. Where where do we go from here once the album comes out? Now, it's, of course, coming out in February of 2017. Will you hit the road and tour with it, or is it sort of like oh, it's no, out there? Oh, no, I'll okay. definitely, okay. definitely tour with it. You know, obviously, Bad Company is my number one love, and, uh, you know, we're coming up on, Jesus, 44 years next year. We plan to tour. Uh, if Mick can't make it, uh, we will you know, we'll get someone to step in for him. Um, but we won't, we normally don't tour until the late spring, early summer which frees me up 
for February, March and April uh, to, to start um, publicising this album, which is very, very dear to me. And I want to give it as, as best a shot uh, as I can. Uh, and, and I love playing with this band, The Empty Pockets. They're a wonderful band. Gives me a chance to step out from behind the drums. We, they have a very good drummer who, who uh, deputises for me when I'm out front or playing guitar or piano. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to going on the road. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it too. Uh-huh. Um, going forward, the, will, will you be making more solo albums? And I, and, and I also want to go back to filling the void as well. Yeah. Uh, the bottom line is, yeah, I mean, I'm already writing songs for the next album, uh, depending on how successful this one is. Uh, you know, we'll see. But, um, you know, look, I've been playing guitar for as long as I've been playing drums, which is about 53 years now, because I'm 67. And um, along the way, I've written songs. You know, I, I, I put... I am a songwriter. I might not be very prolific, but I've been writing songs now for over 40 years. And uh, I've gotten a chance to write with some great songwriters. I've actually written a song with Gary Burr, who's a terrific uh, Nashville songwriter. That's B-U-R-R, by the way. And um, that's going to be the highlight of of the next album, is the song that me and him wrote together. Um... And, uh, you know, depending on my mood, I mean, I write songs about love. I write songs about uh, trying to stay sober and write songs about redemption, all sorts of things. Uh, I even write songs about little furry animals who live in the wood, which I wrote for my children many, many years ago. Um, and now my grandchildren enjoy that song, Friends in the Wood. So, uh, you know, I, I just write songs as they hit me. Uh, so let's, if I can, uh, let's go back a little bit in the history of the band. Um, mm. Last album uh, was Rough Diamonds that had sort of the original lineup or, or Paul Rogers on it. It's mm-hmm. been many, many years. August of 82 that came out. Um, mm. Do you see yourself at any point putting together a brand new album with the current lineup with Paul? Well, put it like this, uh... Uh, Mitch, I would love to. Um, Paul has a new song that we've been uh, airing uh, on the last tour in England and and America. And it was one of the highlights of the set. And we still play well together. We're still in good shape. We have a very good band. Mick is sidelined at the moment. um, But we hope to either get someone in that can help him or replace him. Uh, and I don't see, I don't see us not ever doing another album again. I think the odds of us doing another studio album are very, very uh, favorable. Yeah, and that'd be, uh, you know, that'd be nice to have because earlier in the year, uh, Paul had said that because of the passing of Boz Burrell, mm. that he just couldn't see himself doing another album. How did you take the passing of Boz, and you know how how much of uh, does it complicate things that he's not there anymore? Well, obviously, I was very sad um, at Boz's passing. It was nearly nearly eleven years now since he's gone, and unfortunately, as I get older, more and more of my friends. I mean, in the last ten years, I've lost uh, a dozen good friends to the ravages of addiction, middle to late, uh, middle to uh, old age. Uh, Boz still drank, he still smoked, and that contributed to his early death. Um, Musically, I, I didn't feel, I didn't feel that that would be the end of the band. You know, that for, for some reason, known only to the gods, this band just refuses to roll over and die. Yes, we've been through a few personnel lineups, some good, some bad, but the, the, you know, the real core soul of the band is Paul Rogers, myself and Mick Ralphs. 
Now, Boz is no longer with us. Mick is sidelined. Uh, and that leaves Paul and myself and the current lineup, which is Howard Lease on guitar and Todd Ronning on bass. But, you know, we played with um, Rich Robinson from the Black Crows. We, we played with him on the, the uh, American leg of the summer tour. And it was great. I mean, the band was really amazing. I mean, as long as Paul is singing and I'm playing drums, it's still a very recognizable band. I mean, that's a, it's a long-winded way of me saying, Mitch, that um, the spirit of the band is very much alive and it's very well and it's productive. And I don't ever think of the band finishing or I don't foresee the band finishing uh, and I certainly think and I pray that there's another album uh, in the band for us to uh, to do. Yeah, and I really think so, too. I, and, and I'd love to see it. Um, mm. Peter Grant, your manager yeah. in the early days. <laughs> yeah. You know, when you hear the name Peter Grant, the first thing that comes to mind is Led Zeppelin. It, it's sort of mm -hmm. the, the, the folklore or the lore of Led Zeppelin is mm -hmm. Peter Grant. Um, what did Peter provide to Bad Company? And at times, did you ever feel that he was more involved with Led Zeppelin and you were sort of second fiddle, or is that just completely wrong? You were oh, equally no. as important? With, okay. Without a doubt. I mean, look, Peter, if you look, look back at the history of Led Zeppelin in the beginning, it was actually his band along with uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Page. Because Peter managed the New Yardbirds and, and uh, Jimmy obviously was the guitarist. And they cooked up the idea of a band. Um, you know, Jimmy didn't know Robert or Bonzo at all. And I'm not quite sure how they landed the gig. But, you know, Terry Reid was up for the gig. John Paul Jones and Jimmy were friends together because they were session session men in the, on the London music scene back in the mid 60s. But uh, Bonzo and Robert were, you know, these kids up in the, the Midlands of, of England. Um, so Zeppelin initially was uh, Peter Grant and Jimmy's band. Um, and, you know, when we came on board, we came uh, in late 1973, uh, Peter came to see us playing at a little village hall just outside London. And uh, Swan Song had just been established as Zeppelin's uh, record label. And we were the first uh, band, apart from them, to be on it. Um, so Peter Grant provided security, wisdom, knowledge, and not a little bit of muscle uh, and uh, persuasion and basically, it was, it was a combination that was perfect for us because we were, uh, Bad Company was made up of um, members of three very well-known bands uh, in England. Well, in, in America and England. Uh, uh, Free, Mott the Hoople and King Crimson. So it was a marriage made in heaven, really. Um, but, I, you know, Zeppelin, I think, were always his his babies, um, and he, he was never overt in showing that to us. Um, but, you know, Zeppelin were, were his boys, and, and we, were, we were never second fiddle. He, he guided us very well. He was the best manager I ever had, for sure. Um, and he did an, an amazing job. But, you know, he had his own personal demons, and... Uh, they contributed to his early death. Yeah, they really did. And, and it also, uh, his, well, um, not his, but John Bonham's passing and, and all that sort mm. of, that all played into the Rough Diamond sessions where he sort of mm. pulled out of it. And, and that, that album mm. seems to be this stopping point for the band, in a sense, which, yeah. is, which is strange. It um, was. It, it was <laughs> 1982, although we recorded it, I believe, late 1981. In the aftermath of uh, Bonzo's death, Zeppelin breaking up, and Lennon, you know, Lennon was was killed in late '80, so the hangover into uh, into '81 resonated with us, and we were all pretty 
screwed up. I mean, I was. I don't want to speak for the other guys. That's not fair. But I was going through my own addictions, and uh, the band was pretty much on the ropes at that time. They really were. Uh, so well, let me let me because we're running out of time. So I'll just jump around. No, listen, Mitch. Yeah, it's okay. Uh, I don't have anything else until four o'clock. So oh. you can we well, you can do what you need to do. We'll do. What you need to. Well, okay. Then, well, but let me then ask you about Brian Howe coming in as a singer. Mm. When when that came up. Um, was that something the band decided? Was it a management decision? Was it a record company that says, listen, get out there and, and get a guy and call yourself bad company and, you know, la dog, dog go on with life? Or and, and then a little bit about how do you see him sort of in the history of bad company? Mm. Well, let me, uh, let me say here that that era, the late 80s, I believe it was 88, when he came on board, he was with us for six or seven years. Um, it was not a good time for the band. And I'll tell you what happened. Yeah, the, you know, the band had broken up. Uh, Paul had gone on to uh, a solo career in the firm. And, um, the, uh, yeah, you know, it was uh, a time when me and Mick Ralphs and Boz were pretty much at sea. And we had a call from Arma Ertigan, who was the head of Atlantic, who persuaded us to get another singer. You know, we'd worked very hard to to establish the the name. Um, And we were, you know, we were persuaded to uh, soldier on with someone else. And and I knew Mick Jones from Foreigner, and he'd been grooming, uh, preparing Brian to take over from uh, Lou Graham, who was leading the band. And then I don't know what happened, but it didn't, it didn't come about. And Mick Jones said he knew this very good singer, very eager, enthusiastic singer. Um, and, you know, would we give him a shot? And I got to say from the, from the beginning, Brian Howe was eager. He was a good singer, not, really in the style of Paul Rogers and not as good a singer as Paul Rogers, but he had a different approach to singing and he wanted to work. And so did we. And so we, we took him on board. Um, but it was, it didn't really work. And it's an, it's a period in the band that I regret. And we did tours together. We didn't get on. Uh, there was some friction pretty much from the get-go. And uh, that friction developed into uh, really an out-and-out dislike, uh, which sort of permeated the band. And after seven years, you know, we uh, we parted company. So, it, we, we, you know, we had a, a few albums that were made in that time, but they were a departure from the traditional bad company sound. And it's a period in the band's history that, uh, you know, I hold my hand up and say I was part of it and uh, I instigated and went along with it. But I, I regret it. I do regret it to this day. Yeah, it's, it, it, mm. it really sounds like it. Now, of course, uh, the first album you had done was Fame and Fortune, which was produced by mm. Mick Jones. So, uh, well, right. actually, executive produced by Mick Jones. Yeah, yeah. Um, Okay, so cause I, I was actually going to fo- ask you if you regretted that time, and it sounds that way. Um, mm-hmm. Then let, let's talk about Paul Rogers. You have been with him in a band um, since about 1968, going back to yeah. the free days. At mm-hmm. this point, uh, just on a personal level, what does Paul mean to you? Because obviously you've made all this body of great music together. Is it just you've made great music together, or... Is there something more? I mean, what does Paul mean to you at this point? Well, I think the first, my first words that spring to mind is that he's, he's honesty. He's a very honest guy. He believes in fairness. Um, and he speaks his mind. I mean, he's a, he's a very forthright gentleman. And he's the most amazing singer. Uh, and, I, you know, you're right. I mean, I played with him on and off coming up on 50 years. And there's every gig 
that I've ever done with him in free and bad company, somewhere during that night, he'll sing something that just makes my hair stand on end. And he's done that for 50 years. He's the most gifted singer. Um, we we have a mutual respect. We we get on, uh, but he lives his life and I live mine. Um, and he's just uh, I, I'm just so pleased to have uh, have had the opportunity to play with him over the years because I think uh, we're a, a very good musical combination. Uh, but no, he's a very honest guy, and I respect him tremendously. When he went off and joined Queen in, I guess, 2005, 2004, mm -hmm. 2005, were you somewhat surprised? Were you happy for him? Were you shocked? Were you like, hey, well, what about Bad Company? Where are you going, buddy? Um, <laughs> well, I, when I first heard that he was uh, joining Queen, I thought it was a rumor, and I was completely uh, uh, gobsmacked. Uh, that uh, he would do it. I, I wasn't, I wasn't shocked, um, but it seemed such a, a divide, you know, f from, from Freddie Mercury and his operatic delivery and his theatrics to Paul, who's, you know, the quintessential blues singer. Um, the, you know, their styles couldn't have been more apart. Uh, and yet, thinking about it, you have Brian May, who's one of the most underrated guitarists, an amazing guitarist, who's very bluesy. And you have Roger, who's a very solid drummer. You have, um, um, oh, God, I've forgotten the bass player's name, Deacon. Yeah, John, uh, John Deacon, right? John, thank you. Yes. You know, they're actually quite an amazing band. If you took away the harmonies and, 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 and Fred is operatic singing they're actually you know they're a blues band so it, for me when i went to see uh, paul and queen at nassau coliseum uh, in just outside new york you know uh, during that time they were actually really good and and paul i i was pleased for paul i was very pleased for paul because he was he was playing in front of audiences that uh, he deserved to be playing in front of many, many thousands of people. Um, and, and I believe they, they played some gig in Serbia. There were about 350,000 people. So, I mean, I, it, and I was, yeah, I was pleased for him. But I, I have to say, watching him and hearing him at the, the Nassau Coliseum, I was wistful. Uh, and nostalgic, you know, and, and very much wanted to get back on stage and play with him again because he raises my my game. He raises my, my drumming. Um, yeah, that's it. Well, okay, so l let's talk about raising your drumming. Um, mm. In the mid, I guess, 90s, you were with Ringo Starr's All-Star. Ringo Starr mm. and his All-Star All band. All-Star band, yeah. Right. Um, you know, listen. He's Ringo Starr of the Beatles. Mm. How did you take that? Were, were you? Were you? I mean, I know that you've been in free and you've been around for fifty years, but mm. it's still. You know, do, do you come in there and go, "Oh, it's Ringo Starr," and I try to up yeah. my game? Or, and what did you learn from him in terms of, of drumming? And, and what was that experience like? Well, if you just distill it a little further, you're actually playing with another drummer, and two drummers playing together. You have to be so careful. You have to be um, very cognizant and aware of what the other guy's playing. And we're, we were lucky in that our styles are quite similar. You know, Ringo was a big influence on me, along with uh, Levon Helm, uh, Charlie Watts, and um, Roger Hawkins and Al Jackson, two American drummers. But Ringo was right up there. So when I actually got to play with him, you know, number one, I was pretty nervous because, you know, Ringo is a sober guy. He's uh, got a wonderful backbeat, uh, but he's left-handed. Even though he plays a right-handed kit, he's a left-hander. So uh, when I sat next to him on my kit, we, from the get-go, we said, listen, when, when we do breaks or drum fills, 
you know, you take the first one, I'll take the second one. Uh, and, and, you know, during the actual timekeeping, we'll try and be as, uh, you know, in sync as possible. But it was quite a challenge. And, you know, the first couple of shows, you know, I made some gaffes and mistakes and I was just a little nervous. I didn't want to screw up, obviously. But actually, after a couple of gigs, you know, we, we meshed pretty well together. And and I, the times, the tours that I did with Ringo meant a lot to me because, you know, I got to play not only with, with a wonderful drummer, but I got to play with a bunch of really amazing musicians. Uh, because with Free and Bad Company, I'd been quite sheltered, particularly in Free. You know, we, we weren't encouraged to play outside of our band. And, um, you know, I got to play with Jack Bruce, Peter Frampton, Todd Rundgren, Gary Brooker, you know, a whole bunch of people. And I was very grateful. Yeah, 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 Peter uh, Peter Frampton is is incredible. Um, the Wonderful band play. the mm. band Free, mm. All Right Now is a song that I have heard my entire life, whether it's at a stadium or at a mall or on a radio mm-hmm. or or MTV. I mean, it's it's ubiquitous, mm. and yet the band was only around for uh, for four years, five years, four, four years, years, four years, right, four years. Um, and of course, you and Paul went on and you did Bad Company. Uh, so let me let me just ask you why why only four years why could it not go on and then when you know um, Andy uh, mm. Fraser and and Paul were having their disagreements mm. was it not conceivable to just say well let's just get a new bass player let's just get a new guy and keep calling it free uh, good good question you know all right let's go right back you know the, underlining everything. Uh, in that era was the fact that we were very young. We were a very young band. And when All Right Now hit, uh, it was 1970. I was 21. Paul Rogers was 21. Paul Kossoff was uh, two years younger, so he was 19. Andy Fraser was 17. So we were a very young band. um, And we were immature. We might have had a, a maturity beyond our years playing. But personally, you know, we hadn't really developed. And when All Right Now hit, it was after two years of extensive road work. We'd been all over the country, all over Europe in our little van. We had um, we cultivated this following, this quite fervent following that really uh, was our bedrock uh, of an audience. And when, when All Right Now hit, we suddenly became a, a, a huge band. And instead of playing uh, cities, a different city every night, we were playing a different country every night. You know, we did France and Belgium and Holland and Germany and, and Sweden and Finland. And quite honestly, we were that year that All Right Now was a big hit was exhausting for us. But we were on this sort of carousel of album, tour, album, tour, album, tour. And our record company, uh, because of our youth, thought that we could, you know, we could become this music-making machine. So they kept booking us, and then, you know, we we come back from a 400-mile a road trip from one end of the country, and we'd be in the studio the next day doing a couple of tracks for the next album, then back out again to do some more shows and then back in the studio. So, you know, at that time, we had to come up. And what was the killer, Mitch? What was the real killer? Was that we had to come up with a follow-up to All Right Now, which was really just not on the cards. All Right Now was born out of a bad gig. We we needed something to get the, the audience on our, on their feet, and dance because we weren't really a we were more of a listening band when we first started out we were kind of a serious little bunch we did blues songs we had a sort of medium paced loping beat but it it, it it wasn't something that made people dance so all right now was concocted by andy and paul composed and it was a great dance song but it was a one-off 
it wasn't really it was one aspect of bag of, of free it wasn't it wasn't the be all and end all of free so obviously when we we came out with the stealer which was the follow up to all right now it died a death uh, as did the the album highway which followed fire and water you know from which all right now was taken so both those records kind of didn't do well and it deflated us and uh, Paul Rogers and Andy Fraser made the decision to break the band up and go our separate ways. Um, so that was after less than three years since the band formed. Um, yeah, plus, and, plus, yeah, plus back in those days, unlike now, you know, now there's a lot of bands that have one member, two members or, you know, I know. Back I then, know. we didn't. Well, we, not we, but back then, people <laughs> didn't. People didn't really do that. If, if you know, there was a guy to be replaced, well, then the whole band would change its name. That was that's sort of, true, and I, that's a very, very good point. I've never really thought of that before, but that's absolutely true. And I had no answer for that other than we were very idealistic, and the thought of replacing one member with another. Well, it did happen. Actually, it did happen with Free a little later on in 73 when Paul Kossoff got so uh, addled by drugs and we had a we had two shows in Japan and Paul Rogers played guitar. And and but that wasn't that wasn't really such a bad thing because he was still an integral part of the band and for him not only to play guitar, but sing as well. I was never more proud of that lad. I mean, that man, when Paul Rogers said, you know what, I'll play guitar, because he's a really good guitarist. And, and we went and did two bloody Japanese stadiums in Tokyo and Osaka. And uh, Paul was amazing. Uh, but a little later that year, we went out and did an American tour with Wendell Richardson from Osibisa. And that was one of the most bizarre choices. You know, because Paul Kossoff came back in, uh, he was still still very out of it. And um, we had this American tour lined up. He collapsed uh, before we could even play a note. And as a last desperate measure, we had to get someone to fill in. Because we cancelled two... American tours in the previous year, and our name was Mud in America. So we really had to do this tour. So we got in this guy, this African guitar player, and it, it completely gobsmacked everyone, including me. Um, but, you know, back in those days, that was the exception and not the rule. And now, and now it's really the rule. And now it's really the rule, yeah. Which is strange. Uh, s since you mentioned um, uh, Paul, uh, if I can just get a quick quote on the Kossoff, Kirk, Tetsu, and Rabbit album, because no. you eventually uh, re-recorded Anna for a bad company. Yeah. Um, yeah. That that was a good album, but there was there was an element missing. You would think in terms of it, it just it was sort of well, that in between, right? Well, yeah. Well, we didn't have a good singer. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was the element that was missing. I mean, you had a pretty decent drummer. You had Rabbit Bundrick on keyboards. It was amazing. Kossoff, who was struggling with addiction, but he was such a good player that even though he was screwed up, uh, most of what he played was was wonderful. And you had Tetsu Yamauchi, who was a, a very solid, very steady player. But none of us could sing very well. And, and I tried, and Rabbit tried, and we, we did harmonies. But... We uh, we didn't have a good singer. We didn't go on the road with it. And, of course, it died a death. But it's become this sort of cult album that anyone who has is very proud to have because it was such a one-off. Um, but it was, it was a labor of love, and it was really an, uh, a, a filler, a stopgap between uh, our individual... Uh, projects because Paul's album, uh, Paul's band Peace and Andy Fraser's Sharks, uh, his their bands, they didn't really do very well either, although they did better than, than me and Koss's band. But 
uh, we all really missed the band. We missed Free. And, of course, we got back together in 72 and uh, tried to uh, tried to soldier on uh, for the sake of Paul Kossoff's health. But knowing what I know now about addiction, he should have been in rehab a long time before that happened. And it didn't happen. And it, it ultimately killed him. Right. And especially at that time... Uh, rehab wasn't really much of a thing either. I mean, all these things sort of came on mm. later in the '80s. You know, the band True. members and the rehab, and we, we we've we've come a long way in the last forty years. I, I can say. Well, we have. Um, well, addic- Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go on. No, no. Go ahead. Well, I'm saying um, addiction had such a stigma back in the '70s, and we didn't really know that much about about drugs. We knew about alcohol because AA has been around since the early 30s, but no one really knew about addiction per se. And and Paul Kossoff was uh, an addict, and he was uh, an addict that was out of control. And our way, or the management's way of treating him after he'd had an epileptic seizure and a stay in hospital, was to send him home to his apartment with his girlfriend, his very well-meaning girlfriend, and not even look into thoughts of sending him to rehab and maybe a 12-step program. And so his addiction ran unchecked for years. Um, and the last, the last four years of his life were a nightmare for him. And it's, it's one of my biggest regrets to this day that, that uh, the management didn't take a stronger stance and look after him because... Uh, I firmly believe that he would have been alive today had he been treated properly. Yeah, yeah but I mean, the, the, the mentality back then was, hey, you know, suck it up, Buttercup, go get better. Let you know, p- you know. Yeah. It, it's sure. not like today where we go, hey, let's, you know, it, it, it was a different time. Um, yeah. I know, I know, we're way over time, so if I can just, uh, sure, uh, okay. I'll, I'll finish with these last two, and and we'll, we'll you know, hit and run kind of answers. <laughs> okay. uh, the last tour was the uh, Swan Song UK tour. Uh, Swan song, yeah. of course, generally means that's the end. Uh, are, was that some kind of nod to the, we're done now, or, or? No, I look I, honestly, I don't really know. I, I wasn't privy to uh, the the uh, the concocting of that um, slogan for the tour. And as soon as I saw it, I thought, "Hello, are, are they saying something that I don't know?" Um, no, it's not really. I, I think we will be, do other tours. I think it was more uh, a tip of the hat to the um, the record label because we had a, a live album and we had a, a live album dealing with the band from 77 to 79, uh, a double album released. And we also had saw the re-release of the first two albums uh, on Swan Song. So, you know, I think the, uh, uh, it was an allusion to uh, the, the record label and certainly not the, uh, the last tour the band that this, this okay. band will ever do. Okay, no. and then I'll finish with this. Um, message from the Lost from the last album. Wow. Sort of, you yeah, know, I'm going all over the place. Thematically sort it. of <laughs> deals with, with 9-11 and yes. you, you, what your part in that, which... Yeah. Um, you know, ferrying stuff back and forth for the Red Cross. Mm. What did that time in history mean to you? You know, you you are sort of a not sort of, and that's a, that's rude to say. You're you're you know a British national living in the U.S. Mm. Um, and if I if that came out wrong, please I, I, I apologize. <laughs> no, 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 I understand. Mitch. Um, Don't worry. But but what did that time mean to you, and why did you feel compelled? To, to, to help? I mean, is it just a human nature thing? Is, I mean, I, I think so. Okay. I, I think so. I, I mean, my father was a, we have a, a society or a little organization in England called the Samaritans. And, it, and the Samaritans is basically a helpline where people call in who are feeling depressed or suicidal or whatever. And he manned, he manned the phones for nearly, nearly 20 years. Um, and I guess I inherited that that streak from him. But you know, I lived in in New York during the the attacks. I saw I saw the attacks with my own eyes, and and living less than a mile 
from the World Trade Center, I was very up close and personal to the aftermath. And when I heard that uh, people from all of the Red Cross personnel were coming from all over the country, from Alaska, San Diego. You know, when I went to the Red Cross headquarters in Brooklyn, there were trucks with license plates from Alaska, California, Washington, Washington State. They come from all over the country to to the uh, HQ in Brooklyn. But of course, the crews, the fire crews, the uh, salvage crews, the medical crews, the Red Cross crews didn't know their way around the city. So they were desperate for drivers who knew the city. And, and I've been a uh, resident of New York City for uh, six years. And really, it's quite simple. It's only a grid. It's north, south, east or west. And, and I knew New York pretty well. So I went down to the, uh, the HQ and offered my services. And even with my accent, you know, they gave me a, a, obviously a thorough vetting. Uh, check my background and, um, you know, I became a driver and, and it was quite emotional to drive these people uh, who would come from all over the country and were staying in hotels and take them back and forth to the, the, the pile, what we call the pile, which was the, uh, the north and south tire, towers. Uh, it was just something that I felt compelled to do. I did it for six weeks uh, and, and when I... Uh, I was delivering supplies at one time and uh, all the sirens went off and everyone got very quiet and I saw these grown men taking off their hard hats and holding them to their chest uh, and I saw the first relatives come down the ramp carrying flowers and teddy bears and photographs and I'll never ever forget that moment because grown men were openly weeping. Um, and it was the most amazing time. And and I, here's the weird thing. On the way back on the subway, there was a tattered poem, just a, like the first like stanza of a poem on one of the, uh, the walls. And I read it and it said, Amber Waves of Grain. That's all I, I read. And I found out later that it was a famous poem written in the Civil War era. And, it, and, and much to my horror, a lot of what I had come up with in that uh, song, Message to the Lost, was very similar to that, uh, that poem. And I was waiting at any moment to get a, a lawsuit for plagiarism. But I can put my hand up now and say I didn't copy anything. Um, I just think the time, the time... Uh, was so traumatic that it, it, it sowed this, this song in me, which I wrote in 10 minutes. Uh, and it was very similar to what this woman wrote back in the 1800s uh, when her son or her husband was laid to rest. And um, it's, it's, quite, it's quite similar. But I was very proud of the song. I think it's one of the best songs I ever wrote. But it was written out of necessity, really. Yeah, so, and yeah. it's... it's, it's... It's it really is a sort of that emotional moment. My my dad's birthday is is on that day, and I had taken the day off to go so see him. So is my brother. Yeah, September the eleventh. Yeah. yeah, wow. And I, yeah, and you I took just, the day off. I took the day off that day to go visit him, and I watched the whole thing on TV. And I went this year, two thousand sixteen, oh. to the uh, museum, and I, in fact, you can see the goosebumps on my legs and arms right now uh -huh. as I'm trying. Uh -huh. It 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 really yeah. is. Um, a tough or emotional uh, thing, yeah. and so you know, um, it, it's nice to see that um, that you took the time and you did. I mean, it, it, it means a lot to me, and I'm, I'm obviously it means a lot to. It must have been spiritually uplifting for you, for yourself was, as well. And was, and yeah. anyway, anyway, um, I know you have Good. another interview, and we've gone way, way, way past things. So. Uh, <laughs> Remind, very nicely we've gone over, Mitch. Very no, nice. No worries. Thank no you. Worries. We'll remind everybody that All Because of You comes out February 10th, 2017 in North America. And uh, Simon, a great, great pleasure. Thank you very much, Mitch. God bless. Thank you. You too now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And there you have it, folks, my interview with drummer Simon Kirk of Bad Company. Please uh, do yourself a favor and check out his new album, All Because of You. While you're checking stuff out, head over to Twitter and check me out at Mitch Lafon. Instagram is Mitch 
underscore LaFawn and PayPal dot me forward slash Mitch LaFawn should you care to support the podcast. And, uh, well, that's it. We're done. It's the end of the road. That sounded pretty good, didn't it? Yeah. I think we should do another one next week. Have a good one. Bye for now. Cheers.